You've been charged for staying dedicated to the grind. You have the right to remain silent and keep the hustle to yourself or help others with the game. State your name for the record. Cray OC. How you get that name? Um, Cray uh, stems from Crazy Boy. Uh, Crazy Boy was uh, my dance name from back in the day. I used to crump. And, you know, I just wanted to keep, you know, the same name. So shorten it from Crazy Boy to Cray and OC, you know, because I'm from Orange County. So. I, I try to rep it to my fullest, so that's why it's Cray OC. So where's your hometown from, man? Uh, my hometown's Brea, California. Um, I, uh, I I really just claim Brea because um, I was in the foster care system, so I, I lived in different you know communities all around Orange County. Um, I even moved out to Moreno Valley and um, in Fontana for a little bit, you know. But majority of the time that I did, you know, a good amount of years. Consistently, I, it was rare. I, I moved out there when I was thirteen. So being raised up in the foster care system, man, how how was that? Um, it was it's it's crazy, man. You know, it's and it's, it's like when you're younger, you don't really realize it, but it's it's really systematic, man. Like, you know, I was at Orangewood, which is uh this like orphanage, um, right right by uh, the block over in uh, in Anaheim, and everything there is just. It's like you got to line up, you know, it's it's all like really, you know, really militarized. And it's crazy because right across the way is the juvenile center, you know. So as a kid, you don't really realize it, but, you know, it's almost kind of like setting you up to be in the system. Next door. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah. So what age did you actually get adopted to a family? Um, my aunt adopted me when I was... Uh, my 13th birthday, basically, that was like my birthday present. She took me out the system. And, and, that, that, was, and that, that you went to high school in OC, so yeah. in Orange County, right? Yeah, yeah. So how was it to be, now did most of your peers knew you was adopted when you was in high school? Um, Not everyone, only like my, my close friends at the time, like they were the ones that knew, you know? I wasn't really open about it like that. It was something I kind of kept to myself, but you know, I had certain friends that were around me that I kind of accepted like family members because it was, you know, it was kind of something that was taught in me, you know, from being <clears throat> in different foster homes and stuff like that. You go to a different home, you know, you literally get put into a family, you know, so you gotta, you gotta like adapt to it and you gotta like learn how to like be a part of family, you know, yeah. and it's, it's kind of like a crazy mind thing, but, um, you know, and I, I kind of built some of like my friendships just off of like, you know, family relationships, you know, so. So who introduced you to music? Where did that come in at? Um, so it came in the high school, my boy Ken Choi, he, uh, he used to rap back in the day. And, and I didn't really rap like that. It was something I, I, I kind of talked about, but I didn't really, you know, take it serious. And he was like, yo, let's do a song. I was like, all right, for sure. And um, pulled up to his crib. And he had like one of those little mics, like it was a, it was like one of those little mics that you like plug into your computer and it was like a little, almost looked like a pencil kind of mic. And we were rapping into that, you know, and made a song and like, I, I thought it was like the best thing ever. And then, I don't know, I just kind of gave up on it after that. It wasn't really my focus. I kind of focused more on dance. And then like a few years later, um, I became got into a music group called Extendo Gang, and then that's what really, really opened up my eyes to the music scene. Let's talk about the dance. Now, what kind of dance did you do? Uh, I did crump dancing for many, many years. For Now, was you part of the Tommy the Clown crew or something? Um, no, nah, I, uh, I I knew people that, you know, were, like, originally part of um, uh, my boy Crush. You know, he, he's, like, a pioneer in the crump game. You know, he's been around since those days. Uh, so I was around him. Um, Rockstar, he's he's from the OC too. Jay Slot, he's from OC. Riot, um, a lot of those people I was around just the music or you know, the dancing, yeah. And I just you know I, I watched a lot of them and you know it, it inspired me to really just kind of go hard. Those were like the main people I. I so did y'all just get together and have a dance battle, or <clears throat> how did, what's the whole dance concept of? So basically, what it is is they have what was called crumb sessions. You know what I'm saying and. Basically, it was just a group of people. Everyone would get together. Someone would bring the music, and people would battle. 
you know, or not battle, they would just session, they would just dance and, and it was just kind of like exchanging different moves. It was just like, think of it like battle rapping, you know what I'm saying? Like you got a group of people, you know, everyone would just kind of use uh, MySpace to communicate, you know, and then there was a, a page called the Crumpers Forum. And it was like, a, it was literally just a page that all the dancers would go to. And that's how you would find out about everything that was happening in your city or whatever, you know, everyone would post it there and all the dancers from that city would come out or even people from outside the city would come out, you know, it would be dope. And, you know, it was just basically the same thing that was like, you know, battle rap, you know, everyone would kind of travel from wherever, you know, everyone would form a circle and, you know, people would battle, you know, and so more it's like an it was an underground trend. Going yeah, on. absolutely. Something like absolutely. how they doing the cars, the yeah. Um, takeovers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was it was super underground. You know what I'm saying? And um, and then there was a couple people like that that really helped bring it to the mainstream side. You know, like Chris Brown, he helped bring it to the mainstream side. He he uh he pulled up on, pulled up on a couple of sessions that I had gone to. It was called the Dunamis back in the day, and they were popping. He pulled up there. Uh, T Fly, he used to be he used to be a crump dancer back in the day. He was in Stomp the Yard, you know what I'm saying, with tie dyes yeah. in the very beginning. Um, Audio Push, The Rejects. Um, so after that yeah. burned down, how that's when you got back into your music? Yeah, basically, I uh, I was doing I was doing dancing. I uh, I kind of just got away from the dance scene, and I was doing more so of like dance i was incorporating dance with music but i wasn't fully into music yet so i was doing background dancing for like different artists and stuff like that um the observatory was one of my main home stations me and big riot were doing all kind of shows together so i was his right hand man um he was a background dancer for t-pain back in the day so i was pretty much you know following him we did a lot of shows at the observatory. And then at that point I was kind of like, man, like I, I really want to do this, you know? And cause I, I just love the experience of being on stage and people, you know, cheering you on. And it's just, it's a great, it's a, it's a dope experience, man. It's something that a lot of people don't really get to feel, you know? And, and when I got to experience it, I was like, yo, this is so, so when, when, when was the time you went to military? Was this before or after your So trip? this was, yeah, this was before. Um, I went, I went in, uh, 2008 to 2011 and, um, I was a uh, military or I was security forces and, uh, I went to Iraq, Afghanistan, Qatar, Kuwait, deployed. It was cool. You see any action? Um, I personally didn't do any action, but I, I used to volunteer at the hospital. So I, I would kind of see things here and there, you know, but I didn't really see too much out there like that. No, you call yourself having nightmares of seeing the things you've seen in the hospital? Um, I did have some nightmares. Yeah, that shit was crazy, man, because you think, you think you're ready to kind of see some shit, and then you go in, and then you're like, oh, fuck, like, shit's real, you know? Or even with me, a lot of times, I would have nightmares just from, like, mortars coming in. Because the base that I was at, it was, we were always getting hit with mortars and stuff like that. And just sometimes you'd be asleep and then you just hear incoming, incoming, boom, you know what I'm saying? And, but a lot of the times it, it would happen, you know, like outside, outside of like the T balls where we slept. So it didn't really hit anyone, which was good, you know, but you just never really know. That's why you always had to sleep with your vest on and your helmet on and shit. So how do you think the military shaped you as a man? It. It taught me a lot, man. It, it taught me to really, if you're really going to trust someone, you got to really look into them, you know what I'm saying? And you got to really watch yourself, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of crazy people out there, you know? So you just got to, you really just got to watch your six, you know what I'm saying? So when, when was the time that you actually decided in your mind that you wanted to venture out and find your real parents? Um... Like, uh, I, I had lived with my mom till I was uh, six years old. And basically she was, she was an addict, you know, and she, uh, she had an overdose, you know? She was overdosing in her room. I was outside playing video games, you know, and I was hearing her scream. And I was just like, you know, like, what's wrong with her? So I went into the room 
go check on her, you know, and she's just screaming, help, 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 you know, and then I'm just like, what the hell do I do, you know, and I ended up just calling, I ended up calling 911 because I didn't know what to do, and my mom taught me, like, yo, if there's, like, an emergency, call 911, you know, so the first thing I did, I called 911, you know, they were on their way, and she was, she was just like, yo, like, like dump out the bucket or not the bucket but she had a pan and at the kit and as a kid i didn't know like what it what it meant yeah. you know but the whole time she was using the bathroom and the pan because she couldn't get out of bed because she was so fucked up on drugs you know so it's when i saw that you know it, it kind of like really mentally like kind of scarred me you know because it's it's one of those things that you see and you're just like damn dude like i i don't ever want to be like that you know and and i think like you know, when you see something like that as a kid, sometimes the people around you don't even realize that, you know, what you saw, you know, and that's kind of like the big thing between me and like a couple people in my family, you know, is I saw that shit as a kid. So I know like I ain't trying to do no shit like that to be involved in that. But, you know, a couple people in my family, they see it as like, oh, yeah, like, you know, you probably forgot about it. So in the industry that I'm in making music, you know, I mean, yeah, like, because you smoke weed. Yeah, so, yeah, and, you know, <laughs> and they came up during the, you know, when Ronald Reagan was in office, so they think, like, oh, yeah, you're going to smoke a blunt one day, and then you're going to be shooting up heroin underneath a, a bridge the next day, you know what I'm saying, which is the furthest thing from the truth, you know, and one thing they've always taught me, man, is, is whenever you hear something, like, go research the information to see if it's credible or not. The information is out there, yes. you know what I'm saying, and they don't even want to check it because well, they, they say like, marijuana is a gateway drug. Yeah, but <laughs> now it, it ain't even a gateway drug anymore. They took it off that. They they removed it from the list now. So yeah. as being a kid, calling the police on on the situation. Yeah. As you got older, did you blame yourself for putting yourself in that situation? Because once the uh, CPS came I in did. and all that, I did. I I went through a lot of self-blaming and and i was really depressed for many years from probably up until like i probably up until i graduated high school i was really depressed i was going to all these different therapists but like as a kid i didn't know who they were so i was just placed in a room and i was told to talk to them and i can't really open and i couldn't open up to anyone you know at that time was talking about my problems like that you know so it just never really worked out it was just something I had to, it was something that I had to work out internally, you know? So how did you connect with the gas company? The gas co. Yeah, gas co, gas co. Hello. You know, um, I've uh, I've known them for, shit, probably like four or five years. I, I started off trimming with them. Um, my boy, my boy JB had brought me in because uh, he, uh, he, uh, he grew up with them. So, um... He had brought me in because they needed help trimming. Just began trimming with them, you know. Just you know, just doing my work, just doing whatever I could, just just to show that like, yo, I'm a hard worker and like I'm about this shit, you know. Um, for years, I just kept trimming, working with them, and then eventually, like, you know, they they liked me enough to where like they brought me in, and you know, I even shot my I shot two music videos, you know, with them. Like one of them, I shot at a trim. And then the other one I shot like in the grow is fucking amazing. And um and I was even fortunate enough to even put them in an opportunity to do a stream with B Real. You know what I'm saying? Um my boy E Zone, shout out to E Zone for really making the play happen. I uh, I got some culotto, which was a stream that we did with Yuck Mouth from the Loonies. I got a whole uh, zip of that, I tossed it over to him, you know, I was like, yo, like smoke some of this shit, let me know what you think of it. He loved it, showed it to B-Real. B-Real loved it. And literally, B-Real didn't even say that he loved it. He was just like, yo, like, where'd you get it from? And he was like, Gasco. And literally, he just went on his phone, DM'd Gasco, and had them pull up the next day, bro. <laughs> and, they, and they dropped like half a pound off. Everyone in B-Real TV loved it. And then at that point, he was like, I'm getting y'all on the smoke box. Got them on the smoke box. Now we got a strain with them called the Tropiculado. That's, that's pretty dope, man. You know what I'm man. saying? Yeah, it's it's amazing, man. So, so check so, that shit out, soon. So, since you in love with weed, man, is yeah. your music about marijuana? Or? Oh, yeah. I got a lot of I got a lot of music about it. Um, Ezone, actually, one of the first songs I dropped is called Hank Hill, 
with uh, E-Zone. And have you ever seen that show, King of the Hill? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what does Hank Hill do? That nigga used to just sit there and drink beer all day. But, what, but, where, but where does he work? He works at Strickland Propane. Okay. Selling yeah, gas. You know what I'm saying? So that's the whole premise of the song. You know, trap the gas like Hank Hill. No, no. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, I got another song called Jerry K. You know, shout out to Jerry K. And um, featuring my boy Iron. Uh, he's from Texas, and man, he says he's killing shit out there. He's getting ready to drop a project with Sauce Walker. That's just what. So, started. who are some of your major influences in the music game? Oh shit. Um, honestly, a lot of them are more of like the older artists, you know. So, like with me, like I, I, I love, I love all the West Coast shit, you know, Dre, Snoop, Exhibit, all that shit. You know, I, I fuck man, I, I'm, I just love music, bro. I love East Coast, West Coast. You know, West Coast is my home, so obviously I'm gonna love the West Coast music more, you know, but if it's dope, bro, like I, I rock with it, you know. So when when are you gonna plan on converting your pain of your life story into your music? Um, I'm gonna be dropping some more music about it. I got a project out right now, it's called Whoa, uh W O E, which stands for Words of Encouragement. And and uh the song on there is actually called Whoa, and that's what the whole project is based off of. It features my my um, homegirl, Rosemary. Shout out to her. And um, basically, I, I tell the story about, you know, um, about going through a car chase with my mom, um, getting taken into the system, going through depression, you know, and talking about suicide. And But at the end of the day, you know, I, I learned that, like, it's not, you know, all of that is not worth it, you know, and, and that there's so much more to life, you know. And it's just me, like, so basically it's me writing a letter to myself as a kid, you know, because I'm getting ready to go through that. Words of encouragement. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm telling myself, yo, this is all the stuff that's about to happen to you, but you can't let any of that stop you, you know what I mean? You can't let any of it slow you down. You got to stick to the grind and stick to, you know. That's deep, to man. What you do. I, I yeah. hope you get that project done because a lot yeah. of kids need to hear that. Yeah, it's out now, man. It's on uh, Apple Music, Spotify, every major platform. You the name of the song? It's called Whoa, W-O-E, w -O -E, um, featuring Rosemary. Check that shit out, man. So what's your ultimate goal, man? Man, my goal is just to inspire everyone, you know, anyone that has any doubt in themselves, no matter what they're doing, like if they want to be an artist, if they want to be, you know, a tattoo artist or a fucking rock collector, bro. Like I want you to put your all into it and don't let anyone tell you that you can't do it. Because for many years, people told me that they didn't want me to, do music and shit, and I listen, you know. So I'm kind of kicking myself in the ass right now for listening, for listening. But at the same time, it taught me a lesson, you know. You got to do what's best for you because you're only gonna put yourself in a winning position. No one's gonna put you in a winning position but you. So are you seeking fame or fortune? Um, I mean, I'm seeking the fortune, but I know what the fortune and the fame comes with it, you know. Um, at the same time, it's. I wouldn't mind, like, you know, having my face being recognized as someone that really came from nothing and made himself into something, you know, with no help or no handouts or, you know, just all hard work and dedication. You know, that's really what I'm about. So what artists would you like to collab with? I got a couple different people I wouldn't mind doing songs with. Trippy Red, wouldn't mind working with him. Uh, Bruno Mars. What am I doing a song with him? Uh, Wiz, obviously Snoop, Be Real. There's a, there's like a bunch of people. So you got a list of the yeah, list. yeah, yeah. I got a little list. So describe your music making process, man, from the idea in your head into the actual audio track. Okay, so with me, I don't really like to write my my shit down on a notepad. You know, that's that's just me. You know. Some you know some artists that like to write their notes on on a notepad. I can't do it like that. I, I like to type it out because for one, I have shitty handwriting. So I'm over here. I'm gonna be in the booth and I'm gonna be like, yo, what the fuck I said? Like, it's just it don't work out. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I I honestly I'll just roll up a blunt, you know, put my headphones on, have some coffee because that's my that's that's all I need, bro. I don't really need alcohol. I don't need none of that shit. I just need coffee. A blunt, headphones, and that's it. I don't even need to be in the studio, bro. I could if I got a good, nice pair of headphones, bro. I'm I'm in it. You know what I'm saying? I could sit at a park, 
and write music. I can sit it. You know what I mean? Sometimes I like to do that. I, I'm weird, bro. I just, I, anywhere I just feel like I, I can write, I'll write. You know, even, even if I leave here right now and I'm in the mood to write, I'll probably sit in the parking lot with my headphones on and just start writing. You know? So do you think you um you jump on the ways or the trend of the music or you got your own style? No, I definitely got my own style. You know what I mean? I like when you listen to my shit, you you're you're gonna have a hard time trying to think like, yo, who who does he sound like? You know? Is I don't really sound like anyone. I, I really sound like myself. So what um what would you want your fans to remember you by? I really want them just to remember me by the the guy that went through the foster care system, went homeless two times, and made himself into something that everyone said that he couldn't do. So let's talk about this Craig clothing, man. How did that start? Woo. Yeah, man. So Craig clothing kind of started from uh, me just wanting to learn how to, like, you know, brand myself differently. One thing I, I learned is uh, is if you wear a lot of something, people will notice you rocking that, you know? So I was like, huh, if people see me rocking my name, there's no way that anyone could forget my name because I literally have it all over me. So I'm like, let me find a creative way of how to do it. So I was like, let me, you know, so I, I did this little rendition of you know, uh, the Supreme shit, because Supreme is popping right now. You know, so I just made it like that with like my own thing. And then right here, this is like my actual logo right here, the Cray OC, you know, and I made it with the Fanta logo, but I made it specifically with the orange one because I'm from Orange County, you know what I'm saying? So I want to have it as a representation of both, you know, with me and Orange County intertwined. So you have any partnership with the clothing brand or it's just you? Um, it's just me right now. Um, and then I have like a designer. He, he, he kills all the designs, but he just doesn't design for me, bro. He designs for all type of people, you know? And now, how, how does the deal go on with the designer? You just pay him a flat rate or yeah. he want interest? Yeah, basically I just give him like a flat rate and, you know, he just does it for me. Me and him have like a good relationship. We've known each other for years. He's He's had his own clothing line, and I've modeled and had other people come in. And you know, we've done just a lot of lot of business together. You know, so so are, is this um, clothing line currently for sale online? Um, it's gonna be for sale really soon. Um, if anyone wants to put in pre orders, you can just uh, go on my ins on the Instagram at cray clothing underscore, and you know, you can just hit the DM and just set it in order, and you know. I can get you something hooked up before it drops. I'm doing so, special orders for sure. So, uh, so what's the status of you in a stendo game? Um, yeah, I'm gonna need my lawyer, bro. I mean, come on, it's just a simple question, man. I'm, yeah, man. I, you know, there's, you know, it's. I just need my lawyer, man. Right, face.